Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> I have a very imp important announcement to make. We're going to start. So whoever wants to listen to us should come now or stay outside of the room. No, I'm kidding. This is going to be very interesting. You all know that. Because this is the last plenary session. I know that you have had a very long day yesterday and a very long dinner at night. And uh, nevertheless, I think uh, the, the issue is important and we will see some um, very inter interesting input on the issue of differentiation and on the question whether a differentiated integration is a good answer to Euroscepticism and um, whether differentiation is actually a golden recipe for many issues that do not really work very well. Can differentiation improve the functioning of the European Union? Can it make enlargement possible? Can it help meet expectations? And is it, in the end, a good answer to Euroscepticism in all its varieties? And what does it actually mean for governance of the European Union? Now, differentiation and Euroscepticism probably um, go together, and we will see if the first one is actually an answer to the second one. Uh, and I'm very honored that we will have a highly interesting panel here today uh, with speakers that I do not really have to introduce to you, but um, I will do that anyway, uh, just uh, to name them at least. We will have, we will start out with Frank uh, Schimmelfennig, you know him, he is a member of the TAPSA board, of the old and new board. <laughs> And uh, he's a uh, professor and head of the European Politics Group in Switzerland at ETH Zürich. We also have uh, Funda Tekin, another member of the TEPSA board, and uh, director of the Institute for European Politics in Berlin. And we have Juha Jukola from Finland, another member of the TEPSA board, program director at the Finnish Institute for International Affairs in Helsinki. And John Stevens, former uh, member of the European Parliament, council member of the UK Federal Trust in London. And I have the, the honor to chair this uh, panel today. And my name is Paul Schmidt from the Austrian Society for European Politics in Vienna. So what, what are we going to do? We will see um, some uh, presentations on the issue. Uh, looking at differentiation from very different angles. Um, we are choosing the angles of defense and security, the question of um, what does it mean for, democratic, for the democratic uh, quality and legitimacy of European integration, and what about the narrative? Um, what does it mean for the narrative, for the European narrative? The, this move or this idea and concept of differentiation. We've, I mean, differentiation is nothing new. You all know that. Uh, we've, we are already uh, seeing this in, in many areas. Uh, we've just had a panel on EMU, so I think the, the euro is a good example of this, but also justice and home affairs, security and defense, um, also Schengen, uh, the social protocol. So there are many examples for differentiation for a differentiation that is working, and then there are examples for areas where the differentiation is not really working or has been tried, tried out, but it was not successfully impl implemented. If you take, for example, uh, the issue of the financial transaction uh, tax. Now, um, but the question remains, um, can those who want to do more actually do more? And is this a, a way to advance European integration uh, in a situation where a lot of criticism about Europe is based on the fact that it is not functioning as efficiently as people would like to see it, or would like to have it? You know, the, because we've also talked about public opinion and public perception, 
Um, many times the European Union is blamed for almost everything, but then if you look at the nitty-gritty details, does it really have the competences to solve every, every issue at hand? Um, it is at least a very good platform where cooperation between member states can solve many of the issues at hand. So it is very uh, timely, I think, to discuss uh, this issue of differentiation. And I would like to start Frank, uh, I would like to ask Frank to start with his presentation. We have um, allocated 10 to 12 minutes for the presentations, and we would try to uh, do this afterwards as interactive as possible. So I would like to ask you um, to use your last strengths of, of this Friday and come into the discussion and solve this issue for us. Frank, the floor is yours. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Paul, for uh, the introduction. I think the organizers have chosen uh, a highly uh, important, highly relevant question for this panel. Is differentiated integration a good answer to your skepticism? But they've also chosen a question that is notoriously difficult to answer. Yeah? And uh, of course, we have all kinds of uh, strong normative statements, uh, theoretical expectations. But um, we also have very little uh, in the way of em empirical evidence yeah, that we could bring to bear to answer this um, um, relevant question. Um, and uh, the, the paper I'm going to present tries to make a first step in that direction yeah, of, of uh, giving us some empirical evidence. Uh, does differentiated integration actually, I mean, how, how does it actually impact on uh, Eurosceptic public opinion. So, as I, as I said, the state of the art is uh, uh, full of um, normative theoretical arguments, and of course, as normative and theoretical arguments go, they go in very different directions. Yeah? So, um, to answer the question in the affirmative, uh, authors claim yes, differentiated integration is a good answer to Euroscepticism because it accommodates uh, the more Eurosceptic member states. Uh, it uh, prevents the European Union from imposing uniform integrationist schemes on, uh, let's say, the more Eurosceptic member states. So it helps to reconcile yeah, uh, Eurosceptics with uh, progress in European inter integration. Those who want to do more can do more. Those who want to uh, do less are actually also able to do less within European integration, and in the end, everybody will be happy. Others claim, no, uh, uh, it's not a good answer to, Euro, uh, uh, to Euroscepticism, because um, differentiated integration is also used to, dis to discriminate against uh, some member states yeah, that are uh, de deprived of some rights, yeah, um, and especially think of the Central and Eastern European countries, who have been de deprived through differentiated integration from Schengen membership, Eurozone membership, if they wanted to become members, and from uh, the freedom of movement of uh, labor. It also, by the same token, uh, creates different classes of EU citizens that have different rights in the, in the European Union. And in those countries that, are, uh, uh, that, that get opt-outs, yeah, of course it also, I mean, it, this might this might um, reconcile the Eurosceptics with the European Union, but of course it also alienates those um, European citizens that would actually like their country to be more integrated. Yeah? So here the expectation would be, well, it actually creates more Euroscepticism than it mitigates. But as I said, so far we have we, have, we really don't have any micro-level studies uh, that would give us some empirical leverage on this, on this issue. So what is, what is our theoretical argument in this, in this paper? Um, so as I said before, we start from the assumption that uh, differentiated integration, and here we only talk about opt-outs uh, that some, some countries have from more integration, creates both winners and losers. Yeah? So if a country uh, like the UK, like Denmark, gets an, gets an opt-out from some EU policies, uh, the Eurosceptics in this country will see that as a, as, a, as a gain. They will be the winners, whereas we will also see Europhile losers 
uh, uh, from these, from these opt-outs. Now, if, if this was strictly a uh, zero-sum game, it would not have any effect on EU uh, legitimacy, and it would be neither a good nor a bad answer. Yeah, you would have some citizens that are happier with the European Union, and others that are um, um, uh, that remain skeptical or that um, uh, see uh, the, the kind of European integration that they got as a as a as a loss. Yeah? But we assume that actually. Um, uh, differentiated integration, the opportunity to get opt-outs will create a positive net benefit um, for, for two reasons. One is that um, having the, the choice, having the opportunity to determine your own level of integration in the European Union will uh, create support for European integration both among the Europhiles and the Eurosceptics. So this is an institutional effect. Yeah? Um, having the choice, uh, having the possibility of differentiated integration will create support for European integration across the board and not just with the, uh, with the Euro Eurosceptics. And the other assumption is that uh, Europhiles and Eurosceptics have different baselines. Uh, that means um, Eurosceptics are usually supporters of uh, fringe parties in, in, the, in the national systems, yeah? either of the, let's say, the more radical left or the more radical right. Um, and by definition, supporters of fringe parties are, are political losers because fringe parties are rarely in government. They cannot really de de determine the policy of their um, country. So, uh, whereas supporters of mainstream parties, which are also usually the supporters of, uh, of, of more integration in the European Union, are by definition political winners because the, the parties they support are regularly in government and can pursue the policies that these uh, citizens like. Now, that means um, that uh, a decision uh, uh, for an, for an opt-out yeah, that benefits the uh, Eurosceptics yeah, will, will actually make them happy, will, will make them feel, okay, we can actually change something in the European Union and um, uh, will uh, uh, benefit yeah, uh, their uh, per, per perceptions of legitimacy in the European Union. Whereas for the Europhiles that lose on, a, on an, on an opt-out issue, yeah, this, is, this is just a minor incident uh, in an overall story of uh, political uh, winning. So uh, we have two expectations, yeah, that uh, opt-outs in, increase the, the legitimacy of the EU for all citizens because of these institutional reasons but uh, that uh, it will create particularly high legitimacy gains for, for Euro, Euroskeptics. Yeah? So it's an, it's an overall net benefit, but it will particularly benefit those who are normally uh, the political losers in the uh, history of European integration and in the domestic politics of their countries. So how, do we, how can we study this? Um, we look at... Uh, the 2015 referendum on ending the Danish justice and home affairs opt-out. Yeah, you may remember that because of the Treaty of Lisbon, um, Denmark had to decide yeah, whether they, uh, in, in order, for instance, to uh, remain a full member of Europol, yeah, they had to change their opt-out from justice and home affairs to an opt-in system. And uh, this, was, this, was, uh, this, this, this decision was uh, put before the people in uh, Denmark in a, in, a, in a referendum in 2015. So this a switch from an opt-out to an opt-in system was supported by all the government parties, uh, but also by the mainstream parties out, out, outside of government. But it was opposed by the fringe parties, both on the left and on the, on the right. And the... Um, Opponents of this uh, change won the referendum uh, with 53% of the vote and a 72% uh, turnout. Now, uh, uh, based on this, uh, on, on this outcome, uh, and in line with our theoretical argument, we would, we would, accept, uh, we, we, we would expect that Eurosceptics, the winners in this opt-out referendum, 
in, increase their perception of the, the, the legitimacy of the European Union significantly. Whereas Europhiles uh, do not, do either, also either think that this was a, was a good uh, uh, thing to do or do not change their perception at, at all. Now, uh, we, can, we can benefit from a, from a coincidence, yeah? because while the Danish referendum took, took place, uh, the uh, European Commission had a Eurobarometer survey out. Yeah? And um, some of the citizens were surveyed before the referendum, and others were surveyed after the referendum. But we assume that it is basically random, yeah? whether some citizens were interviewed before and other citizens were interviewed after the referendum. And one of the questions uh, that was asked in this uh, Eurobarometer survey was about internal EU efficacy. Yeah? So this question that you all know, does my voice count in the European Union? Um, which tries to tap yeah? feelings of can I, do I as a citizen have an influence on, on what is going on in the European Union, and we take that as an indicator of support for or the democratic legitimacy of the European Union. Uh, we also have information on um, Europhiles and Euro, Euroskeptics because people were asked to identify with, the, with uh, uh, parties, and uh, we use a, a design which is called regression dis, dis, discontinuity design, um, which uh, is a quasi-experimental design uh, which, which takes uh, citizens that were, that were asked, let's say, one day before the referendum and one day after the referendum, takes them as some kind of a random uh, treated and non-treated uh, uh, group and tries to find out whether the referendum yeah, had an influence on their perceptions. And this is what we, what we find. Yeah? So on the, in the, on the left panel, you see um, those that were uh, surveyed before the referendum and those that were surveyed after the referendum. And you can see in the, in the two days, yeah, one day before, one day after the referendum, there's, there's quite a gap. Yeah? Uh, so uh, uh, right after the referendum, the average perception of um, whether, you, whether your voice counts in the European Union in, in increased quite uh, uh, strongly. And also, let's say, the overall levels of uh, support based on this question um, are also quite, quite different. But what is, what, is, uh, what is more important for our argument is, is the uh, right-hand panel where you can see that uh, uh, for the, for the uh, supporters of mainstream parties, yeah, there was not, not much of a difference. This is the triangle. So this is not statistically significant at conventional levels, whereas for the, for the fringe party supporters, yeah, um, the fact that they won this referendum yeah, really uh, uh, gave them a boost. I mean, they, uh, th there are uh, si significantly different levels of people who, after the referendum, answer, yes, my voice counts in the European Union. And we take that as evidence that the fact that they, they had the choice and they won this referendum reconciled them yeah, with the European Union because suddenly they, they uh, found, okay, we, we can actually change something according to our preferences. Um, we also did some robustness checks, so, we, so it's really a Danish effect. Yeah? We do not find any effect in other member states that were also surveyed at the, at the same time, so it's really the Danish experience that uh, creates this change. Um, we did a few other things that I don't want to go, go into. Um, it also, we do not find the same effect uh, if people are asked about national Efficacy, so it's really about what they can do in the EU. Yeah, not, it's not, not about what they think they can they can do in Denmark, um, which gives us some um, confidence in the finding that this is really a um, an, the effect of having the choice yeah, to, to determine the level of integration of your own country um, through this uh, referendum. So my con my conclusions, um, uh, I, I think the. The small piece of evidence that we have, and, and of course uh, it, it, is, it is limited, uh, seems to indicate yeah, that uh, citizens value the chance to voice their opinion on, on integration issues, and uh, that Eurosceptic citizens yeah, actually benefit the most. They, they adjust their evaluations 
the most, yeah, because they suddenly get a, get a chance to have an impact yeah, on, uh, on their country's uh, integration in the European Union. Um, so, differentiation has the potential to narrow the gap between Eurosceptic and Europhile citizens, can be a useful tool yeah, to recalibrate citizen elite gaps too, and it has the potential to sustain support for European integration on the, on the level of uh, um, citizens. I also want to flag the caveats yeah, uh, of, this, of this study. So we don't really know, is it an effect of differentiated integration or is it an effect of direct democracy more purely, yeah, just having the chance to vote yeah, rather than having a chance to uh, determine the level of integration of your own country. It's also not clear from the data that we have how sustainable this effect is. We see a strong effect around the date of the referendum, but we have no idea whether if we ask the people half a year later, this would still be the, be the case. They would still feel, feel empowered. And of course, uh, the other big question is how representative this Danish case is for the, uh, for the overall differentiated integration in the European Union. But it's, let's say it's, um, it's one small piece of empirical evidence that at least gives us some uh, some support to the idea that, indeed, yeah, differentiated integration can be, uh, can be a good answer to Euroscepticism because it reconciles Eurosceptics with European integration. Thank you. How much discrimination is there in differentiation? Uh, keeping in mind that the concept is actually an inclusive concept where every country that wants to join can actually join in also on a later stage. Yeah, so I mean, uh, the good news is that uh, there is this discriminatory differentiation in the European Union, but it's uh, normally um, temporary, yeah? Tran transitional. So. It mainly affects new, new member states. Yeah? Um, so this is the, the, the case that in order to get into the European Union, the old member states uh, introduce uh, some discrimination for the new member states. Uh, the, I've, I've mentioned the, the examples, um, access to uh, the Schengen area, access to the Euro, uh, access to free movement of uh, um, labor. But, um, Basically, this is, this is for, a, for a few years. Yeah? Um, so, the, uh, um, say the, 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 the normatively nice feature about differentiated integration in the European Union, even if it is discriminatory, is uh, that um, this is just designed as a temporary uh, discrimination, and it depends a lot on the efforts of the discriminated countries yeah, to, over, to overcome this. By, um, making themselves fit yeah, for joining Schengen, for joining the Eurozone, um, and, uh, and in that way, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a comparatively harmless version of discrimination, but it's discrimination nevertheless. It could be also be seen as a sort of positive motivation. <laughs> and That's, of course, how, the, how those countries that discriminate the others see it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> But there, there are different views to it as well, of course. Uh, Funda, uh, the floor is yours, please. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Paul. Um, thank you also for uh, having invited me to speak here. And I think I had a, a bit the same line of thought when I saw the question. I was like, wow, what, what a question. So how to answer it, basically. And um, because I think there are different um, aspects in the question. And thank you also for your introduction into this panel, because it also kind of made it then a bit more clearly, but I think at first when you read that question, you really might think, um, yes, it, it is a good answer to Euroscepticism um, because, and this is also what uh, Frank was um, highlighting, uh, it basically differentiated integration, if you perceive that as a tool for managing heterogeneity among the member states, um, this would also help to accommodate Eurosceptic trends. Um, simply by not requiring everybody to uh, immediately uh, be on board. But then when I um, thought um, a bit further, I then also realized that there are also some certain Eurosceptic parties that 
operationalize differentiated integration to their own means and ends. And um, the example I can give you here is um, the so-called Alternative for Germany, AfD in, in Germany, that was founded as a single issue party promoting the so-called Dexit. Um, you know, so, so Germany should actually uh, leave the European Union. So, uh, not, not the European Union, the, uh, the Euro at first. In the end, they were also considering the European Union as a whole. So this is also something where it is actually, um, well, you know, also a tool for your skeptics to, um, uh, to make use of then actually criticizing the European Union as such. So, you know, you can really, really argue, argument in both ways. And then also with regards um, to your skepticism as such, I think it's a definition. So are you talking about uh, political parties or public opinion, just like uh, Frank said, and I think Frank has um, outlined it uh, very clearly, um, the different aspects of that, and I fully agree uh, with uh, the analysis also of the, the Danish case, because I think here uh, Denmark is really um, the example where um, the public opinion and the Euroscepticism in the country has kept uh, the Denmark um, out of um, well, several policy areas. It is not only the justice and home affairs, but it's, uh, it's Schengen, it's uh, the Euro, and the common security and defense uh, policy. And then also with regards to you know, the question of uh, direct democracy, it's then also a question of differentiated integration being such a complex phenomenon, um, whether the, um, uh, the public opinion then actually grasps the entire consequences of that. And the example you gave with the opt-in and opt-out thing, and we really kind of to understand what would be the benefit, the one way or, or the other, I think it's really also uh, then a question of rather than being able to um, undermine the Eurosceptic trends, uh, rather than thinking about uh, the issue as such. The, a similar example is the CF DCADP um, opt-out, where from the structure of this policy area, an opt-out doesn't really make sense, and Denmark is currently trying to reconsider also that opt-out. Um, but since I did not really do in-depth research with, all, uh, with regards to these different um, elements, I then decided to kind of broaden um, the approach uh, to actually um, analyze your skepticism and whether differentiated integration might be a good answer to it um, by um, also using some of the research that I've been doing within um, the Horizon 2020 project EU IDEA, which is one of the three consortia, and like in div EU, um, that is dealing with differentiated integration currently. And um, what we are doing there is actually we are looking at um, in how far um, political differentiation um, has actually um, changed narratives on political unity of uh, the European Union. So uh, we trace narratives of political union within two time frames, uh, which uh, political differentiation um, crystallized itself with uh, great intensity and that in turn to increasing forms of differentiated integration. So allow me briefly to run you through the concepts that we deploy. First of all, it's narratives, and narratives are constructions, uh, according to our understanding, uh, constructions and reproductions of stories and political realities, so they have a goal, uh, and so, so where it should, uh, should go. Um, either more integration in the future or less integration or more differentiated integration in the future, and they have a plot um, of the narrative. So that is, um, results from three elements. It's then the time dimension, it's the space uh, where actually the actors are um, uh, uh, voicing the narratives, and also the, the con contextualization of the narrative. Um, political union, unity we define as the ideal goal of the EU being a political community where member states share the same rights and obligations. Um, and then political differentiation uh, results from uh, the member states' heterogeneous composition um, in, the, in the EU. Um, this is then uh, differences uh, that can be identified in, but not limited uh, to the EU countries' respective political systems, uh, socioeconomic factors, historical foundations, and demographic patterns. Um, and the timeframes we're actually looking at uh, for, for our narrative analysis 
is um, then we chose two time frames. The one is um, the years preceding the so-called Big Bang enlargement of 2004, and uh, then the years when the crisis in the Eurozone uh, area were at their heights, so between 2010 and 2014. Um, of course, there might be um, also more recent examples, particularly if you're then uh, thinking of Euroscepticism um, uh, with uh, regards uh, to maybe the migration crisis or, um, or the Brexit. But I think the migration crisis had not, has not yet uh, resulted in at least not primary um, forms of di uh, primary law forms of differentiated integration, but rather flexibility. And Brexit is simply not over yet. So I think it's really legitimate to at least look at these. Um, to earlier time uh, periods in order also to, to make the argument and, and show a trend. We uh, then had four countries that uh, we um, chose to look at, and we chose them according to their representation or being part of um, the regions with a different relevance divide, uh, but, uh, dividing lines between um, within the European Union regarding to the two um, uh, time uh, periods. And the one is the east-west divide, which is relevant for the big uh, bang enlargement. And the uh, second one is the north-south divide with regards to the Eurozone crisis. Uh, and and we were looking at Germany, France, Poland, and Italy. So what did we find? Uh, basically, we find two overarching narratives um, for uh, each of the milestones, um, and uh, that although struggle to accommodate unity and diversity, and I think this is very uh, interesting to see, both center around unity. So the entire um, discussion with regards to disintegration uh, is at least uh, with regards to uh, these two um, cases not in the picture. Um, and uh, we also then see that by um, examining the differences and overlaps between both narratives and also their sub-narratives that play into them, um, that uh, then the analysis showed that um, although some of these sub-narratives might first appear very similar, they actually followed a different plot. Um, and uh, they pursue a distinct um, goal, which could also be different with regards to the sub-narratives, but still uh, with regards to the overarching narrative, it's rather um, unity. But uh, with regards to the plot, it then changes. So looking at the um, enlargement uh, period, and um, there it's really the overarching narrative is united in diversity. I mean, it, this has become the motto of the European Union afterwards. And it's characterized by an underlying positive atti attitude um, towards the growing diversity and political differentiation in the EU as a result of the Big Bang enlargement. Um, so they were, it was more focused on the necessity to reunite um, uh, the country, and I think it's also here important to say that we looked at a period um, that uh, were, where uh, member states were anticipating and not yet dire directly experiencing a heightened political differentiation. So it was rather more uh, a positive uh, um, attitude. And so you had sub-narratives of there is no alternative to enlargement. Uh, the EU project is a factor of increased power because we can speak with one, one voice. Diversity is a strength. Um, and the EU is a strong anchor um, also for the exceeding countries. And differentiated integration, but only uh, of a temporary nature. Um, so basically, if you then sum, uh, sum this up with the Big Bang enlargement, it is, as I said, a more positive attitude. And um, then to um, speak, well, to, to use the words of Obama or also later Merkel within, within the migration crisis, you can really say it's a yes, we can. So we can do uh, pull this off, and uh, if differentiated integration is, is necessary, we will have it in a temporary nature. So this is rather positive. This positive atmosphere and perception has worn off over the years then, and then when the crisis hit, uh, we um, have basically a change of uh, perspective. It's still unity, but then it's more divided in unity. And this is, of course, uh, with regards to the effect that um, the member states were so differently hit by the crisis, um, and uh, also had different perceptions on how to solve the crisis. So it was a, a, diff a difficult um, perceptions among the member states, but also a difference between 
between the European Union level and the member state level. So um, you also could see that the European Union um, institutions or leaders of the European Union institutions, they were really promoting, we need to do this together, uh, we have to find solutions. And on the political level, you had then divides between social democratic and uh, left-oriented actors that were more promoting the self-regulating market system and more conserv uh, conservative actors were then actually uh, kind of uh, making the, uh, um, the debt policies of some uh, member states, countries responsible for, uh, for the crisis. So it was really then uh, being more the, the di diversity among the member states with regards to the effects of the crisis and the approach to the crisis became uh, important. So you had, um, again, five sub-narratives. It's, again, no alternative to integration. But this time, it's rather not on a voluntary basis, but more, you know, we are facing this crisis, and we really have to do it now. Um, the EU was perceived as a failed leader, so not really um, able to, to manage this crisis. It was then diversity as a challenge rather than as a um, as a strength, and you have then uh, also the question of uh, solidarity and uh, the, the conditional, uh, conditionality linked uh, to solidarity. Um, so if you then want to um, kind of rephrase the di uh, divided in unity with regard to, uh, to the yes we can, you see a clearly yes we must. You know, so it's really something that uh, we have to, uh, to use that, and then maybe even thinking more about uh, more long-term forms of differentiated integration rather than uh, only of a temporary, na uh, temporary nature. So how to link this back to the question of this panel? In both uh, cases presented here, the focus of the narrative remi remained unity, and in order to allow for unity in spite of uh, the challenges, different forms of differentiated integration were set up. Um, the optimism of the pre-enlargement period resulted in temporary forms of differentiated integration. Um, and uh, the Eurozone crisis it was more than uh, perma permanent forms of integration. Um, so the more critical narratives on political unity, if you then also want to link that also more with re regards to more national, well, centering the national interest into the focus of uh, well, political leaders and maybe even um, public opinion in terms of then having that in terms of a US skeptic uh, trend. Um, so the more critical narratives uh, on political unity become uh, the more centered, they are, um, um, they are also the more relevant uh, might become solutions of differentiated integration. So here's the link between you know, critical uh, narratives and the forms of differentiated integration. Um, so differentiation is an answer to your skepticism, I think. This is what uh, you can say from that. But whether it's a good one and which form of differentiated integration is a good one, this is also something that uh, you know, by looking at the narratives, you might not be able able uh, to answer, because then you would have to enter into the question of, uh, well, is it a multi-speed, um, this is what you also refer to, differentiation or permanent forms, and then you have uh, different assessments of these forms. Thank you very much, uh, Funda, for your insight. I would also have a follow-up question uh, to you, because while listening to you, I was wondering if this uh, temporary nature of, of differentiation that we always emphasize is not in some areas becoming a permanent nature of differentiation. And uh, if uh, what you have mentioned, this uh, division in unity somehow, if this becomes too exaggerated, in fact, and uh, not really, it's not really stays temporary. What does it actually mean for the governance of, of the European Union? Um, okay, I think um, if, it, this of course also depends on uh, the scope of the differentiated integration that we have, and I think we currently have already sorts of permanent forms of differentiated integration, and um, it is still working. But um, I also think, and this might also re relate back to what uh, Frank was saying, if you really have then the, the opportunity to choose, um, you know, to, to have opt-outs, whether this is really legitimating uh, European integration as such, or whether no, not at the end we really end up with some sort of l'Europe a la carte um, issue when you then really have to, well, have the opportunity to actually um, 
uh, link, uh, well, uh, to simply opt out of something uh, that uh, you do, do not uh, support or you're not interested in participating. But I think also with regards to the permanent nature and also the perception of uh, whether uh, differentiated integration is something good or bad, I think you can really also uh, look at the Polish case, because when Poland was, you know, becoming a, uh, a member state within the Big Bang enlargement, it was very keen on, you know, we have to do things together and, uh, you know, if differentiated integration only the, of permanent nature, because being afraid of being stuck in the second class after having entered the, the European uh, Union. But then within the uh, Eurozone crisis, there Poland was really reconsidering whether, um, you know, to, uh, the necessity is really there to join the, uh, the Eurozone or not. So really then turning it around and using differentiated integration to the own purpose. So I think this is uh, the differentiated picture that you get. Yes, it's great to be on this panel and it's been great to be in this conference as well. And uh, when I was thinking about my speaking notes, I thought that I'm, when I'm speaking after Frank and Funda, so perhaps the concept of differentiated integration is already been uh, discussed quite widely. So I decided to focus on uh, uh, differentiated integration in EU's foreign security and defense policies, uh, perhaps more sort of a uh, also pragmatic view. This is also partly because we are at FIA uh, started a research on this very topic under one of these uh, Horizon 2020 projects, the EU IDA idea, what Funda also, also referred to. So the first thing what I was uh, thinking when, uh, when thinking differentiated integration and the question of Euroscepticism uh, in the field of foreign security defense policy is that the link here perhaps is somewhat uh, more indirect. Uh, uh, but I think when one thinks about it, it becomes more and more evident uh, 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 all the time. Uh, I think one of the, one of the developments, I think, what we also heard yesterday was the Brexit vote and the followed Bratislava process. And uh, in that context, of course, uh, you might remember that the security and defense uh, was one of the key uh, policy fields where the leaders decided to focus upon. And, and many of us experts actually thought that this might be one of the policy fields where the member states could move forward uh, as migration and EMU. The other two policy fields uh, were more dividing uh, for the member states. Uh, I think also if we, have, if we look at the developments ever since, so there is uh, again a stronger focus on EU's uh, foreign policy and that the argument that the EU must become uh, much more stronger uh, uh, currently, uh, in, given the changes in external environment, I think there we see many changes, but one particular one is, of course, the return of power politics and also the return of great power politics, where the question is whether, the Europe, whether Europe will be a playground for other great powers to, to operate or whether it will be a meaningful actor in the, in the global order. And I think in this context, we have seen now the uh, emerge of a geopolitical commission, uh, uh, which might be a bit different than what uh, President Juncker's political commission was. And I think this represents a quite, a, quite a change in terms of rhetorics. It's not very long time ago when the commission said very explicitly that it doesn't do geopolitics. And that was, of course, the time when the Ukraine crisis was uh, was uh, uh, on the agenda and when actually Russia was uh, accusing EU to, to, to maneuver general geopolitically with its uh, political association and free trade uh, arrangements in its uh, neighborhoods. But I think when one look at the priorities and organization of this new commission, so one might actually just suggest just, just that we might see a more a geoeconomic than geopolitical commission. There is now the discussion and debate in Brussels whether the priorities and organizations actually suggest that the high representative borough will have a less of a role in the commission and will focus more on the CFSP and work with the council and the member states. Well, I think thirdly, you can see that when one look at the euro parameters, you, you see clearly that the citizens uh, support uh, EU in foreign security and defense policies. The support for the CFSP and the CSDP have remained very stable. It, it's actually a very, very high CFSP above 60% and the CSDP above 70%. And there's also quite interesting uh, uh, EP uh, uh, Eurobarometer a couple of, years, couple of years back where they also asked 
the, the citizens' views about the uh, 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 mutual assistance clause, uh, the, the 42.7 of the Treaty of the European Union. And there's, uh, uh, for, uh, there, 85% of the citizens supported the clause, yet only uh, some uh, more than 50% had actually knew what it means. And this might speak actually for the abstract nature of these policies for the citizens, but I think it's clear that there are some clear expectations among the citizens that the EU will take a, a bigger role in these policy fields. And from the Euro parameters, you clearly see that there are at least two priority areas uh, with security implications, and those are terrorism and migration. Of course, those are fields where uh, foreign security and defence policy are only part of the uh, 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 response, but anyway, it is uh, very important. So against this back background, I think it's uh, plausible to expect, and I think this has been very much the narrative of the EU as well, uh, that if the EU can advance in these uh, policy fields, this will have uh, and achieve some results. Uh, this would provide some answers to Euroscepticism in terms of, of consolidating the EU and providing it uh, a legitimacy, uh, at least the output legitimacy. So how all this relates then to the differentiated integration? I think the, the, the answer is very, very simple here. Uh, it is, of course, the, 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 the reality that it's been very difficult for the member states uh, to move on uh, in these policy fields uh, uh, ever since they have been uh, established and the differentiated integration has been seen to provide some new possibilities uh, to move on and make the EU stronger in these policy fields. Uh, I think, however, if one looks at the, uh, uh, the, the situation, the differentiated integration is nothing new uh, in the CFSP nor in the CSDP. Uh, and uh, and I, I remember when we were preparing for the Finnish presidency and, and there is now the, uh, the, the proposal to move towards qualified majority voting within the CFSP, we were reminded, we were reminded that it was actually the first Finnish uh, presidency in 1999 which tried to implement uh, some of the innovations of the Amsterdam Treaty with regard to the CFSP. <laughs> Uh, uh, that are where the uh, instruments of constructive ab uh, abstention and so joint strategies uh, kind of move towards perhaps more uh, 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 qualified majority and differentiated approach. And even if these treaty-based mechanisms within the CFSP have ever since been uh, developed further, they have not really put in use. I think this is something what we have found already. And also in the field of defence, I think it's very uh, interesting to note that there has been clearly a hesitation to move towards uh, a differentiated integration pathway. So when the PESCO, the Permanent Structured Cooperation, was already uh, included in the treaties in 2009, it was only launched in 2016. And, and, and this, of course, allows uh, defence cooperation, even defence integration among the smaller groups of member states. But of course, the level of ambition of the launch PESCO has also been called into question because almost all of the member states are participating in it. And although it has this modular, modular approach so that within the PESCO there can be differentiation, so different projects within smaller groups, uh, the question whether it really represents a kind of differentiation that was, that was in Vashats in the, in the convention uh, when the constitutional treaty was negotiated is, is a question interesting question in terms of differentiation in foreign security and defence policy with some, I think, also important results already that we have seen relate actually the inter informal forms of cooperation in these policy fields. And I think these take place often in the margins and outside of the EU structures, actually. So, of course, we have the EU3 uh, including UK, France and Germany, uh, which plays, played a, a very important role with regard to the Iranian nuclear program and its, uh, and its solution. Uh, then we had the Normandy format where Germany and France played a major role uh, uh, that relates to Ukraine and the Minsk agreement. And then uh, I think what we also have seen is a kind of uh, uh, various uh, uh, minilateral defence cooperation initiatives which takes place outside uh, the EU uh, structures. And of course, for all of these, the question to, how, to, to what extent and how they are actually linked to the EU's uh, official uh, decision-making structures is, is, is a very pertinent one. 
uh, of course, the high representative was, uh, was doing the negotiations for the Iran uh, uh, deal, and, of uh, and with, uh, with refer to the Minsk uh, uh, agreement, uh, the France and Germany were briefing the European Council, uh, uh, I think in real time, actually, what were the happenings there. And of course, these minilateral defense cooperation initiatives are perhaps seen as a way of, of providing uh, more impetus for the defense cooperation, and they don't necessarily mean that this would mean less uh, defense cooperation within the EU structures. Uh, but I think it's within this set, uh, setting, and especially with the, with the, with the Franco-German initiative to establish a European Security Council, where we also have seen now the proposal from the Commission to move towards uh, uh, qualified majority voting in the CFSP. Of course, this proposal on security, uh, European Security Council, it's, it's, it's not yet a concrete one. Uh, I think the different elements of it uh, and, the, and the discussion about it is, of course, something which has uh, send sort of alarming signal, signals also throughout the Europe that who would be included it and uh, what would be the role of that Security Council, how that would steer the EU's official common foreign security policy and, and so forth. Uh, to conclude, I think my time is, uh, time is up. Uh, I think that what we can see in the field of foreign and security uh, and defense policies, there is cl clearly this kind of a recognized need uh, for stronger EU uh, in these policy fields. And there is this rising popular support for it. And I think the differentiated integration, if it manages to move this policy field forward, could then provide some answers uh, to deepen integration and force also efficacy in these uh, policy fields. And this, of course, could then enhance uh, the EU's legitimacy and also that way tackle Euroscepticism. But as the most interesting, perhaps, developments in the field of differentiated integration in these policy fields seem to be taking place at the margins or outside of the EU, I think uh, there is a kind of a, some, some notable risks also uh, attached uh, to this very positive uh, assessment, what we, what we hear uh, in many, many conferences and also often from the EU. I think there might be a real danger that we, ha we, have, we are witnessing a move away from the EU foreign and security policy towards perhaps European foreign and security policy. And I think the Brexit is obviously one which, which also brings this question very topical, what will, be the what will be the relations after the Brexit if it ever happens, and how the, the big uh, three uh, capitals uh, continue to coordinate their policies. And I think this might actually backfire in terms of, of Euroscepticism, because the Eurosceptic movements in many, many of the uh, EU member states, their focus on the national sovereignty and the kind of rhetoric of take back control. And actually, the exclusion uh, from the tables where the key EU uh, decisions are made uh, uh, and then expected to be followed by others uh, could provide sort of a new uh, uh, impetus, actually, for these movements uh, to, 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 to criticize uh, uh, EU. And I think there are also serious uh, transparency issues, of course, when we discuss uh, foreign policy, security policy, defense policy, the transparency is not necessarily the first uh, uh, thing uh, that, the, that, 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 that is attached to the decision-making process. But if we move increasingly towards sort of unclear decision-making structures and informal coordination, so obviously the transparency issue is very relevant and could very easily actually contribute to the, uh, the Eurosceptic uh, party's agenda. So I will stop here and uh, pass the floor back to Paul. Uh, Juha, I, I was wondering, uh, listening to you, I was wondering if, um, if foreign security and defense policy and a differentiation, which is actually done in order to make progress, in our context can actually be an answer or a good answer to, to Euroscepticism because compared to Schengen, Euro, European arrest warrant, 
compared to many other examples, this is not really so tangible. And uh, ambitions are high, progress is very slow. Um, it is in a very important field, but it is not as transparent or as visible or as tangible as the others. Is, it, is differentiation in this area really a good answer to your skepticism, or is this just too far away for people to relate to it? Well, well the point what I, what I wanted to make is that it, it seems to be that it's, it's, it's a bit far away at the moment, and this kind of uh, uh, divisions among the member states, uh, different strategic cultures, different security interests, I think this is something that the citizens understand, that this is something what why actually the EU in these policy fields is, is, is not as strong than in other uh, policy fields. Uh, but I think the danger there is that when there is this need, recognized need to move forward, this is something that there needs to be more European foreign policy if Europe doesn't want to become a playground for others. So I think this is something what the leaders, they recognize, and this is something I think what the, what the population generally starts to recognize. So then it's a question that, that how this is done. And if it's, if it's done in terms of more European coordination, which is obviously the traditional answer, you know, diplomacy, secrecy, big capitals, uh, alliances, uh, a coordination, this, this might have a kind of a, 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 a risk element to it because it, it then could feed into this discussion whether the European Union is, uh, is kind of uh, transparent, whether the member states really can make a difference within the Union and have a, have a legitimate position in the first place in the decision making where the decisions are made. So in this sense, I think this might also explain why the member states have been very cautious to advance in terms of differentiated integration uh, in, in these policy fields. So if you have a European Security Council which sets the European foreign policy positions, what is the role of the CF, CFSP then in there and you know how the countries who are, however, part of the CFSP decision making can, can access and impact on those decisions which are taken somewhere else. So that's, I think, it's, it's a risk element uh, uh, which, which is related to this. And, and, and perhaps the, 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 the suggestion that in this policy field it's a good idea to move forward uh, gradually also and also with, with the unity uh, and also looking at the other ways, uh, the qualified majority voting, I mentioned it many times here already, I think that's something which could actually provide uh, answers and also change the dynamics within the foreign and uh, Foreign Affairs Council. Thank you. you uh, John, what do you make out of all of this and what is your answer to the question posed for the panel? I'd just like to make three points, really. One about the principle of this discussion, about uh, the risk of differentiation. Um, one about the nature of your scepticism. And uh, one about specific policy. Perhaps I do do the, the, um, the principle first, then the, 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 the policy question, and then finally about the question about your, um, the, the nature of your scepticism. I would have thought that Brexit is proof that differentiation is not a successful policy. I mean, the, what is, we're ignoring a bit in this discussion is this confusion about whether differentiation is essentially a delay, that it's allowing people to still travel in the same direction towards the same objective, but um, some will go slower than others. Um, and that is not the same thing as differentiation, which is leading to people who have different outcomes. And I would argue that a major factor leading to Brexit has been the readiness to constantly concede to British desires for opt-outs on a whole range of questions. And that if the European Union had been more coherent and more determined, particularly perhaps with regard to the Euro, um, where there were serious geopolitical issues involved, the influence of the United States and the status of the dollar on the city of London and things, these were factors, these were very major strategic questions which were evaded and um, delay, opt-out, was a means of um, allowing a state of mind to uh, be created 
um, that made Brexit possible because the British failure to join the Euro, um, although in the long run a major strategic disaster for the City of London, in the short run, being outside, not a member of the Euro, but being able to essentially run its principal markets and still be the major financial centre, created a situation in which feeling, well, there was no real price to this. The city did fantastically well out of the Euros, even though it wasn't in it. And so that allowed us, and, and without any question, uh, the decision not to join the Euro was the fatal moment in which started the process towards Brexit. Now, that brings me on to sort of the policy question. The, we had a very interesting um, session earlier about the, the Euro. Um, I just wanted to address the, the, the question that Professor Begg was raising in the previous session about the problem of very low interest rates and uh, the problem of um, the Arma Deutsche Oma with these, very, uh, with these negative interest rates and how that is creating pressures. And the, the Euro is the integrative project of the European Union. But that is because what lies behind the Euro it, and what lies behind the whole success of the European project is the power of integrating free markets and economies of scale. The point about the euro is that it makes possible price transparency and a level of, um, of economies of scale that, are not, that would, are not possible without a single currency structure. And therefore, actually, every second of every day in millions of transactions, the euro is binding the European economies closer together. That is a fact. And, the, and what, what is missing in the moment is, is a rediscovery or a reassertion of the, of the market power of, uh, of integration. And so the, the crucial question about low interest rates in, in the euro, so negative interest is the current uh, problems that we have with quantitative easing and the rest, is why is the price mechanism not working? Why, you've got a situation where the the Arma Deutsche Oma is stuck with um, having to pay um, her bank um, to deposit money or is investing in, uh, in giving the German government money and uh, is paying the German, money, uh, German government to look after her money in, in uh, uh, Schlatzanleihe. But um, uh, whereas at the same time, the quantitative easing has led to asset inflation, house prices in Berlin and the rest. Well, the question to ask is why is the price mechanism not working in the sense that people are moving the savings of, um, of, of German citizens into higher yielding assets? Why, and what you're looking here is the lack of an equity culture fundamentally in Europe compared to the United States, a lack of a, of a culture of risk in markets. And I would say that when we're looking at the problem of growth in the European Union, and the problem of, uh, which is the, the critical issue that we face. One key factor is that we do not have, we have not created in Europe, um, a sufficiently flexible uh, economic culture that is able to take advantage of the huge economies of scale that are the potential in the European market. And that's the issue that, that really lies behind all this. Um, let me come on to, finally, Euroscepticism. Um, I'm not sure Euroscepticism really exists in this sense that, um, but again, I'm focusing on the Euro because that's my big interest. I mean, the, the, the original, um, the, the people who set up the alternative of your Deutschland, um, or even if you're looking at um, uh, the Front National in France to a, to a somewhat lesser degree, I mean, when originally established, particularly the, in, in Germany, it was a, a movement against the euro. It was a whole lot of professors who didn't like the euro. The, the shift of the debate is now very, very different. It's now all about identity. It's about Islam, the risk of Islam, immigration, all of that. Now, you can say what you like about this, <laughs> these opinions. Um, they're certainly not liberal. They're certainly not progressive. They're certainly not tolerant. Um, they certainly fly in the face of what most of us would regard as the essential features of European culture, um, as we've come to understand them in the post-war period. But um, they're not obviously anti-European. And what we're seeing is actually, in some respects, 
a tougher-edged sense of what might be Europe, one which is much more hostile to the external world, much, much keener to talk about its own identity. These are not obviously anti-European as such. They might be anti the institutions of, of the European Commission and some of its values. And perhaps it is also, uh, in a sense, the, the, the real product of, of, of globalization, which has enhanced inequalities in all our societies to a greater or lesser extent, and which was a major factor in, in, in Brexit, without any question. The Brexit vote was a vote against London and the wealth of London, far more than it was a vote against Brussels, actually. Um, but this uh, hostility towards uh, the benefits that have gone disproportionately to elites and has led to an anti-elitism which has certainly spills over into hostility towards the institutions of the Commission. Um, but that is not the same thing as being necessarily hostile to the European project and European ideas. Uh, people who are more concerned about creating a common European identity, who want to create a sense of, um, who, who are uh, wish to protect that identity through controls on immigration and the rest are not, in my view, being anti-European. And being anti the European Commission is not necessarily a threat to the European Union project, provided the European institutions are able to adapt to that. And here, I just refer to what I wasn't able to say sufficiently last night in discussing the, the situation in, in the United States and James Madison and the rest. The critical difference between the a US path towards federalism and that which we have seen in the European Union uh, since the Treaty of Rome has been the poor status of uh, the European Parliament, in essence, compared to Congress. The, 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 really, the missing element, I think, which needs to be strengthened if we are to address, address this issue, and, and where, do you, where do you, in a de democratic society, where do you sort out the distinctions between the, the conflicts between diversity and unity? Um, it is in a parliamentary context. And as long as our parliamentary context is anchored in, uh, fundamentally in a national level, then we have a major problem in addressing these challenges. And if we can enhance the status of European level democratic debate, and that may not necessarily be simply the parliament, it may also be making the Council of Ministers more like a Senate and more of a proper forum. That, in my view, is, is, is the way forward. Thank you. Would you say that uh, differentiation is rather the problem and not the solution? I think differentiation, in as much as it shows a loss of, uh, a con uh, it encourages a, a loss of will in pursuing a fundamental, an ultimate common purpose, then yes. I think what, what happened with Brexit, I mean, you can say that Britain is an exceptional case in a whole range of ways, and, and, and the fundamental reasons for Brexit go, go beyond any, any, any institutional questions. It's about the, the fact that Britain has had a much happier history than, the con than continental Europe, fundamentally. That's the, the, the real difference. Um, but the, um, and, th and that has given us a whole set of, of, of a range of different priorities. Um, we don't see the importance of unity in the way that the continental experience has created. But yes, I would say that um, it allowed a sense that it was possible to, to, to have a sort of European um, cooperation without any real focus of, on the ultimate purpose. That European cooperation can only ultimately work if its purpose is ever closer union. Once you break that uh, objective, you can talk about timing and forms and all the rest, but once you you undermine that objective, you're undermining the whole project. But I was wondering if we would ever ha have had uh, the single currency if it would not have been for a differentiated approach. Well, of course, that, that, but it's, it's one thing to say, ultimately everybody should be in the euro, but you know, most people can't join the euro at the beginning. And certainly there are several, several countries um, who joined the euro where they shouldn't have done. There's no question about that. Um, but the crucial point is, is, is accepting the, the, the same objective that ultimately um, in the euro, whatever it is, or Schengen, or um, 
that, the, that everybody's going to end up at some stage in the same place. And what, is, what has arisen in the differentiation argument, and what certainly has been a feature in, in, the, in, in Brexit in Britain, is that you, you've drifted into a situation where people say, well, maybe you know, people will, will, will sometimes never join the Europe. Um, or, or never be in Schengen, or, you know, that, that, that is a very different proposition. Thank you, John. Uh, before I go into the audience, would you like to, to comment on, on, on something that was said, or? No. Yeah. Yes, Frank, go ahead. And so I, uh, please, please prepare your statements. Um, I think I also want to take uh, issue with, with your introductory statement that uh, Differentiated integration uh, was somehow the the root cause of uh, um, Brexit. Um, so I, I, mean, I think I share your view that had the UK ad adopted the euro, Brexit would have been much much harder yeah? because uh, would have been impossible, or maybe maybe impossible. I mean, I would before the vote, I would have said, well, leaving the European Union for uh, the UK. Is, is impossible, anyways. Yeah, but uh, it, it's, it's, it still happens. Yeah, even with with all the costs that it uh, that it in, entails. Of course, had the UK adopted the euro, these these costs would have been much higher, and that might have been enough. Yeah, to just switch the outcome yeah, of the of the vote. But I think we uh, uh, we have to be careful here because um, uh, we have other cases. Yeah. So I mean. Uh, when we look at Denmark or Sweden, um, in these cases we see that uh, differentiated integration has actually helped um, reconcile Eurosceptics with the European Union. And uh, the, the case I presented is just a, just a short, um, uh, just a small piece of evidence for that. Um, uh, Danish public opinion uh, has uh, become much more favorable over time yeah, as the number of opt-outs um, in, in increased and there's uh, little appetite in uh, this country for, <coughs> for uh, uh, leaving uh, the uh, European Union. So I think we uh, have to be careful here. And I think the uh, Brexit vote has been a response actually uh, uh, to a decision of the European Union to be in, inflexible yeah, with regard to the demands of, of the UK. So it, it was the no yeah, to giving any kind of opt-outs from the single market yeah, that, um, given that the uh, immigration issue was, was the highest ranked issue in the uh, Brexit vote, signaled to the British voter that in this case they would not get an, get an opt-out which they had always gotten before. Yeah? And, and I think this, you could, you could equally well argue that the inflexibility of the European Union um, was the uh, uh, cause of the, of the narrow vote uh, to uh, leave the European Union. So I, I, think, um, I think you made a, a right point to say that the UK is special in many, many ways. Yeah? But I think we need to be careful uh, uh, with making the link between the extent of uh, differentiated integration and the <coughs> propensity of a country to leave the European Union. I don't think it's, I don't think it's that kind of slippery slope, yeah? and we, we don't have strong evidence for that. You are. Well, when Sweden and Denmark was mentioned, I, I couldn't help to the temptation to comment a bit, because of course this is something that we discuss uh, quite a bit now with our Nordic colleagues. And, uh, of course, there are the economic rationals and there are the political implications of related to the Euro membership. Uh, but it's not in one or two, it's in quite many roundtables where, where, the, where the, the Danes and Swedes seem to recognize that because of Brexit, the situation has changed. And this also gives them perhaps uh, more reason to, to discuss about the, the Euro membership is not any, anything in the near future. But this discussion, in a way, the understanding that when a big player like UK is moving out, uh, and there is this, there used to be this second tire in a way, yeah. the country is well, outside. They no longer have a blocking minority. Exactly, and the leader or big country right. leading it, so it, it, it changes their position in the, in the in the in the union, and this is something which is, I think, quite interesting. Mm. I agree. Do you want to come in, Funda? Uh, yeah, just uh, very briefly on another term. Uh, the Euroscepticism, because you, you were saying, John, that uh, 
you um, think that there is no such thing as Euroscepticism, or it's very difficult you yeah, know, to, to see um, whether it, it exists. I think it's really the question of how you define Euroscepticism, because I would rather tend uh, to have a different assumption in the other direction, see what is not really Euroskeptic, because you, know, you have the scale between soft Euroscepticism and hard uh, Euroscepticism, and um, I think even if you are in favor of the European Union, but just of different, uh, you know, supporting a different approach to uh, how things are currently going, this is already Euroscepticism, in, or could be Euroskeptic, in, as defined in, with regards to the uh, scale of soft and, and hard Euroscepticism. So I think it's really the question of how you define it. It's, it's an interesting point because in this um, um, a moment of publicity, if I may, in, in this book which is coming up in, in, in May on Euroskeptic, Euroscepticism and the future of Europe, where we have um, 39 different country cases, in fact, uh, the 28 plus uh, the Western Balkans plus Iceland, Norway, Turkey, Sweden, Ukraine. Um, there you also have 39 different definitions, basically, of how they perceive and how they define Eurosceptic parties. So this is, this is an, an interesting uh, issue to look in, and uh, it also shows the uh, diversity, sometimes in unity. <laughs> um, but back to you. Um, who would like to come in? There are two <coughs> questions or comments here. Do you need my microphone? Yes, okay. Then I just say uh, we will collect some questions and we try to answer them as good as possible. Yes, I think. So, okay. I don't need it. Pirat Kuzik, Estonian Foreign Policy Institute, ICDS. Um, three points, but uh, keep, try to keep them short. I think that the risk or the danger of um, leaving some of the countries out needs to be uh, thought through more thoroughly. And I think here, especially Sweden and Denmark, it's not easy to be out. And the pressure you get, and especially in terms of if you think about the governments in the middle, the pressure you get at the European level to do things of European nature, and then your domestic public, who maybe has a different goal. And so if you're the government in the middle, you want to satisfy the both. So now, if you have a kind of a group that democratic public doesn't give you a mandate to join, but then on the other hand, you want to be a good European, then I think that the, this risk and this pressure needs to be thought more thoroughly through, because this will have um, further consequences to the general working nature of the European Union. Mm -hmm. If you want to talk more in depth, we can go into it, but, um, but I'll, I'll stop here. Um, the second point I wanted to do is again, and going back to what Juha was talking about, European security and defense landscape shows us that those small formats, there's so many of them, but let's not forget that most of European Union and Europe is made of very small states with very small resources and capacities. So if you're going to kind of, let's say, break it up, then it is a real challenge for those smaller states to be members of those different formats. Because in the end of the day, you only have a limited number of people. Basically, it comes down to people. And so this is, again, something that, may, that by going even more different, you may just make it almost impossible for some of the states to be, be members of all those different formats. And thirdly, and this is the biggest problem I have with this, this differentiated integration argument is that the European Union, that the motivation for integration is to get big in size. And in a time of geopolitical challenges, I don't see, I don't understand why we ourselves are creating divisions within ourselves. And, and that kind of comes from me being an Estonian and always having a geopolitical look almost whatever political problem I start with. But, and that comes especially in foreign policy. There is no point to do foreign policy today if you only have three countries taking part. The point of the European Union is that 28 countries create the size that you can play with at the global stage. So again, I think, you know, I'm starting to sound like, a, like there was a point about Europe is at the cross, cross, uh, 
cross, at the crossing. Um, but it is like if we go that way, we are in danger of losing much more than actually gaining, I think. Because that the fundamental point, what we are undermining the fundamental point of European integration. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Natasha Wunsch, Sciences Po. Um, I, I really like the kind of the overarching question of the panel, differential integration as an answer, as a solution to your skepticism. And I want to um, ask two questions to, um, to Frank regarding uh, your paper on the, on the Danish case, which I find very intriguing in terms of your findings, but I wonder to what extent, it, or let's say more reserved on the extent to which it allows you to speak to the broader question in the sense that it seems to me a very specific um, context of differentiated integration empower, being an empowering moment because countries choose. And in many cases, countries do not choose but are excluded, at least temporarily. Um, and so if you could just give us a, a sense of the proportions, because I know that you have the, the big data set, in which proportion of cases of differentiated integration do correspond to the self-selected opting out as opposed to um, being imposed. And my second comment goes um, to, you, you also flagged the, that it might potentially be a direct democracy effect uh, more than the differential integration effect. And I was thinking maybe you can even look into that in the Danish case because they have had, so it, it would need to correspond, of course, again, for the, for the Eurobarometer because they have had all of these, um, these uh, referenda. But if it is, or if, if we do have a suggestion that it, the empowerment comes not from differential integration but from the simple choice, is there not a risk where in that you would be effectively advocating for more referenda on EU-related issues, which would probably be a much higher risk of contradicting progress in, uh, than differentiated integration would be? Thank you. And there, there's a question over here, Adrian. Thank you, Adrian Schout Klingenel. I, I only have a very small technical question. Um, to what extent will flexible integration be part of the Green Deal? Um. That, that's a small question at the end of a panel. <laughs> Thank you for this. Are there any more questions? We are now going into the first and last round, I'm afraid, because time is running. Um, we, we learned yesterday that the EU sometimes uh, knows how to stop the clock, but we still have to work on this here. <laughs> because people have planes to catch. Okay, um, then I go back to the panel, and um, I think there were two questions directly posed uh, to Frank and Juha. Juha, you want to start first, maybe? Yes. And then, then we solve the Green Deal, and then we all go home. <laughs> yes, uh, so the risks related to the, uh, the common foreign security policy, common security and defense policy and, uh, and the move towards uh, differentiated integration. I think I agree with what you were saying. This was actually the, the point where I wanted to raise in a way that this is, uh, this is the situation where I think it must be very carefully evaluated that when there is this need for more uh, foreign policy, more security policy, more defense uh, uh, within what structures that integration, cooperation is, 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 is achieved. And there is, of course, the temptation to go to the more informal pathway, and this is something which, which obviously has been used already. It's been proposed, although we don't know where all these proposals might lead. And, uh, and then, of course, the question how this, how this is linked to the EU's uh, decision-making structures and the possibility of all the member states be part of it is a very relevant one. But uh, I'm, I don't know whether... Uh, it's a bit difficult to assess at this point of time uh, how, how worried we should be, because this is something that I remember discussions with Funda and, and perhaps also with Frank and when we were discussing uh, differentiated integration. Uh, it seems to be that it pops up in the history of integration always when there is this kind of uh, urge to move the integration forward. And it doesn't necessarily materialize uh, as such. There are all these ideas. And, and partly, I think, these initiatives and these informal forms of cooperation, they might actually provide the kind of the political motivation for uh, the member states to think what are the options here, whether we want to go within the EU with our decision-making structures or whether we take the risk that it is moved uh, 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 beyond. I think that's the kind of the, my answer to that. So the, the jury is still out there. Of course, this time might have a bit different uh, 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 trends in a way. So we don't we don't know not, we don't know that yet. Uh, 
but I will perhaps pass the floor now to Green Deal yes, and for it, someone else. I agree. <laughs> I would agree, Frank. <laughs> okay, thanks for the, for the uh, questions. Um, some um, small remarks on, on, uh, uh, on, the, on the first set of questions. Um, I think you're uh, nicely pointing out some of the dilemmas yeah, of differentiated integration, and I, and I, and I, and I think uh, uh, these are not to be under, underestimated, and, and, and this panel should not be uh, seen as an, as an attempt to do so. Uh, but two, let's say, two more uh, positive notes on that. Yeah? One is um, there are studies that show that even those countries or those governments yeah, that have been forced by their people through a referendum to opt out of policy areas yeah, um, are usually integrated in the policy making of these areas in more in, informal ways. Yeah? So, of course, they cannot be fully, fully uh, um, part of it, but when it, when it comes, let's say, to uh, discussions on European economic policies, there are informal ways yeah, to integrate the Danes and the Swedes in these discussions, um, which, of course, is not the real thing, but it mitigates somewhat yeah, this, um, this divide. And um, I think your, your point on defense, uh, that, that brings us back to the, to the fundamental dilemma of differentiated integration. Yeah? So, in a uh, situation in which you have heterogeneity of member state preferences and capacities, is it better uh, to remain at a lower level of integration but in a uniform way, or is it better to move ahead but not with all member states? And the uh, European Union's answer so far has been, well, it is uh, uh, better for us to move ahead, yeah, even if some of the member states don't participate in the hope that in the course of time um, countries may, may, may join in the end. And I think if you think about the defense area, which is one that is integrated at a very low level in the European Union, I think the only way, if you're con concerned about building a European capacity, the only way to move ahead in, in, in this uh, area would be through differentiated integration because I don't see... Um, in the uh, current context, any possibility that we will have a, con a consensus across the entire European Union on uh, more, on sub sub substantively um, higher integration in defense. Then, of course, the, the question is, who will, who will join? Yeah? And will the size of the group that moves ahead, will that be critical enough yeah, uh, to really enhance the defense capacity of the European Union. And of course, if you only have uh, uh, militarily weak countries yeah, wanting to move ahead, this will not be a, be a benefit. So size is critical, yeah? but um, I think when the, when the choice is, well, either we all do it together or we don't do it at all, I think uh, the option of not doing anything is usually the worst one. Yeah? Uh, now to N N Natasha's point very, very quickly. So I, again, it's, it's important to point out that we have these two different uh, um, situations of differentiated integration, which you call the self-selecting and uh, the other one I would call the, dis the discriminatory differentiation. Now, what we see is that um, uh, most of the differentiation in, in, in the European Union just quantitatively is, is of the self-selecting kind. And as I pointed out before, the discriminatory kind is, is usually uh, transitory in nature. So it's, 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 it's usually for, so based on our data, it's an average of seven years, yeah? and after seven years, those, those that have been discriminated um, join as full members in these, in these policies. So that, I think, um, say, uh, uh, limits the damage, yeah, but of, because quite evidently, and this was not part of, of our paper, but quite evidently, those that are discriminated are not happy uh, with uh, a differentiated integration. And... Um, um, there was a small technical question at on, the on end. The, on the, I mean, um, actually, uh, in... In, in environmental policy in the European Union is an area in which we have quite a bit of differentiated integration, not at the treaty level, but at the level of secondary legislation. Uh, because uh, this is an area where we have uh, both heterogeneous uh, preferences of the member states and heterogeneous capacities. Yeah? 
greens are not equally strong in all member states, and the capacity to uh, transform industries yeah, in, in the direction of clean energies is also not equally distributed. So I think if, again, like, like in the case of defense, if the European Union is ever going to be serious yeah, on, the, on the Green Deal, I think you can, you can only have a consensus in the European Union if you allow some countries yeah, to uh, transform in a uh, slower way than others, in a, in a less, um, in a less uh, demanding way than others, because um, otherwise I fear that uh, the, the, the difference in, in, in interests and capacities in the EU is too large to arrive at a, at a serious consensus on a, on a real green deal. Of course, you can also always paper over things, but if it's going to be serious, it's going to be differentiated. Okay, um, thank you for all the questions. I think m most of the things have already been said, but I really just also here with regards to period, uh, periods questions, just would want to underline, I also share, you know, the, the concerns, you know, whether differentiated integration is really the solution, I don't, I'm, and I also agree that we do not want to s sell it as the solution. But, um, I mean, differentiated integration has been part of the European integration process since the very beginnings. and. I usually have a, a picture, um, a, a graph, where you really see how differentiated it currently already is. So I think uh, we should also not demonize uh, differentiated integration in that sense, but really then rather think of what are the, the correct forms of also ensuring that um, it's not going to be of permanent nature, but rather having then more the, the um, if, possibility of having centripetal effects rather than centrifugal effects. And you know, there are also certain mechanisms like you know, for PESCO, you need definitely more than three member states. You know, you, you're going to need at least nine. So I think there are certain uh, mechanisms that already then um, allow for some you know, uh, movement towards uh, having everyone on board. And I think this is also something with regards to the Green Deal or also the question with the solidarity uh, um, in, in the migration crisis, uh, because of course, we could move ahead with um, differentiated integration differentially um, because um, there is such a great heterogeneity among the member states, but then there's also the one theory of which, in which policy area actually such differentiated integration would have centripetal or centrifugal effects. And that is the Bicolica um, a, um, a theory, which is then kind of playing with the public goods theory idea. And as long as you have you know, externalities and also the question of if one um, member state is joining, whether the benefit would increase or decrease for the group. Um, and I think both defense and environmental policies are really classical public, good, uh, public goods. So if you then set up differentiated integration, you might have to, uh, to uh, account for that being rather of permanent nature rather than of um, of a transitory um, uh, nature. This is just something to, to think about, but maybe in order to get a head start, differentiated integration might be the case, but I would see it a bit uh, differently. Yeah. Um, I think the point made by the lady from Estonia is absolutely correct. I mean, if you're sitting in Tallinn, you understand immediately the geopolitical importance of European unity. And I think the failure um, in places like Denmark is that you've not had a political leadership that has had the courage to actually persuade its skeptical public of the case for European. It is a, it, we, have, uh, we have allowed, and this has certainly been the case in Britain to an extreme extent, which has led to Brexit, we have allowed a whole lot of uh, the opt-out mentality, the, the, um, a, a Eurosceptic frame of mind and institutional hostility and things to grow, and there has not been an effort made of leadership, political leadership, essentially, to persuade the case, uh, persuade people of the case for closer European cooperation. So in that, that example of differentiation, I regard as a, as a failure of political leadership, essentially, um, and a, a weakness of conceding to, to um, Eurosceptic uh, um, public opinion. Um, the real problem of differentiation um, when it comes particularly in defense, um, but also in green policies, is free riding. I mean, it's all very well saying, um, oh yes, yeah, some people can go ahead with defense more, but I mean, what is the fundamental reason for the crisis that we have in European defense? It is that the Americans feel that the Europeans are free riding. They are paying for defense, and they have happy, been happy to do so, but they're now not so happy to do so. 
And that problem will be reproduced if we try to address the, the uh, a withdrawal of American support by having only a few people who are prepared to spend money on defense and take it seriously, and a whole lot, have a whole lot of people sitting around uh, not paying the, their dues, and yet benefiting from that defense. And free riding is also a problem in green policies, because you know, there is a cost to moving to a more uh, uh, a carbon neutral economy. I mean, there are huge opportunities in this, and fundamentally, I'm very optimistic about a shift to the green economy because I think this could be a major new impulse for the integration of the European economy and the economies of scale that we have. Uh, I, I think that there are, uh, uh, there's grounds for real optimism in that from, a, from an economic point of view. But the fact remains that free riding in the shift from our current economy to a, to a one which is much more uh, environmentally friendly is a real problem. And I don't see, uh, if, if, you, if differentiation is a mask for free riding, then the, we're not going to get anywhere. But the fundamental problem is lack of leadership. With the peop and, and this, I think, is the democratic deficit. The, the, I come back to this. And that we have got to have a European-level debate that persuades people of the importance of European cooperation. That if we do not, as, as the American colonists said when they were forming their constitution, if we do not hang together, we will hang separately. We have four minutes left, and there's a very urgent question here over there in the second row, please. No, it's not so much a question than <laughs> just a short remark, because the Green Deal is um, nowadays really the, big, the biggest challenge we have to face. The new institutional cycle showed that after all these years of crisis, uh, financial crisis, migration crisis, in a way also political crisis, the new um, Green Deal, like the Commission now announced, and uh, this is what we are waiting for, um, is now um, a really a challenge to make a common answer. And um, I, I'm, I'm not sure if differentiation would be here the right approach because the European Council in December is uh, striving for climate neutrality until 2050 and it is the big target to get political agreement of all of the EU27, you know? And therefore, sorry, 28, because uh, the Brexit is uh, still not happening at this moment and uh, therefore I think it will be very tricky because it will be a very differentiated field. A lot of member states are in different situations and um, the big picture is hard to reach and it's the new growth uh, strategy in a way like the Commission President uh, said and it will be a very broad um, um, area we have to deal with but um, here I think um, it, it's maybe the time is ripe to, to, to follow a common target again, because like the um, EC, the European Council president, approaching, M Michel said, he wants to reach the first climate neutral um, continent. Europe should be uh, here in a leading role. And therefore, it's a big target, you know, and I think um, it, it's, it's really important that in this way the European Union should stay together. This is just a remark. Yes. Well, thank you very much for this, for this last statement. Um, this is working a little bit like a Swiss clock here, so we'll be, uh, we'll be finishing and concluding right on time. And I think maybe um, we could agree that um, there needs to be consensus on the objective, but the contributions will be, of course, because we all uh, have different starting points, the contributions will be, will be different. Um, but in, in that sense, we probably cannot talk about differentiation or differentiated integrations because we have to um, reach this agreement on the, on the objective and on, on the target. And I think that's, uh, that is fundamental. And I hope we will reach that uh, in December at the European Council. To conclude, I would like to thank all the panelists, you, Funda, Frank, John. I think uh, this was an excellent panel, and um, this will not be the end of the discussion. This is rather the beginning or the continuation, uh, but this, is, this brings together two elements, um, two developments, which we have to look into much more in detail. On the one hand, differentiation. On the other hand, how, how does this impact public opinion? And 
even the, the issue of, of the, uh, the, the differences in terminology and definition of the terminology of how uh, differentiation is perceived and how Euroscepticism is defined is already tricky. And uh, I, as I said before, we will look into that uh, more in detail. And it is a quarter to one. And I will hand over now to Lucia to conclude the conference. And I would like to thank you all very much for listening and uh, contributing to this panel. And please give them a big hand of applause.